Light at the end of the tunnel. There's actually two tunnels here. One tunnel, the people who are going blind. The other tunnel, that's my effort, my quest to do something about that. And the light, that's the same. It's the light of sight. It's the light of seeing, seeing something rather than nothing. Well, it's a long story, and here's the short version of it. So let's start with me as an undergraduate. It's then that I developed an intense uh, interest in neurobiology and the brain. And that's when I encountered the following uh, depressing statement, ran head on into this, as regards the mature brain. Everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. Off to a good start here. So that seems pretty rough. How are we going to deal with this? And just in case you think this comes from uh, uh, somebody who talks tough. Um, it actually comes from the great Cajal, who is the most preeminent neuroanatomist of all time, so with some authority. Um, but what people skip over is his very next sentence. It is for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. Well, that was inspiring. So the idea of fixing the brain really uh, got me excited. And um, as delusional as that might have seemed at the time, um, regenerative neurobiology was just getting rolling. So uh, there was a potential there, and I was really excited by it. I applied myself vigorously to my studies, and in particular, I paid a lot of attention to embryology. My idea was, um, if we learn how the brain wires itself up in the first place, maybe we'll get some clues in t terms of how we could possibly rewire it later. But it wasn't until medical school that I got to actually work on some of these ideas in the laboratory. And I started working with retinal transplantation. And here's what the model looked like. We were putting retinas into the brains of rats. Why in the brain, you might ask? Well, the point is we're making new connections. We're not trying to recapitulate exactly what was already there. We want to make new ones so that we know they're new. And my particular interest in it was seeing whether these new connections were functional i.e. had some kind of capability to help uh, restore circuitry. Um, so here you see some drawings uh, that I made back in the time. So on the left is uh, a view down from above on a rat's head, um, and you see the eye sticking out uh, to the left, and that's where we're going to monitor for pupillary activity. And then down below that, you see we've opened up the skull, and the reason we do that is to expose the retinal transplant that's inside the head. Um, so what's going on here? Well, here's a schematic on the right that gives you not only a closer look at what's going on, but some idea of what I'm up to. So this is the rat's brain stem seen at an angle, um, and the thing on top there is the transplant. That's a retinal transplant that we put into the rat's brain. Now you see something coming out of that transplant. What is that? That's the fibers that the transplant has grown, trying to make a new optic nerve, basically. and those. Fibers are spreading out over the surface of the brain stem, looking for somewhere to plug in. And the stippling shows you where they found the visual centers in the host rat brain and plugged into those centers. And one of those centers, seen right here, uh, is important for the pupiloconstriction response. And so my idea is I was going to position a fiber optic light source right over this transplant. I could blast it with light at the time of my choosing, and then I could look at the pupil in the eye, remember over here, and I could see whether that pupil does anything. The idea of being if this, this third eye, if you will, in the back of the head could see the light, well, it would transmit that information to the brain, and the brain would say, well, there's light coming in, better close down on the pupils. Um, so it was a great idea, and I went at this very diligently, and I, I shined a lot of light on a lot of rat heads, and well, not a lot happened. Those pupils were just staring back at me. The months went by, the years went by, my colleagues were laughing at me, you know. <laughs> this looked really ridiculous. And then one day, bingo. 
And that's exactly what I wrote in my lab notebook. I put a little star around it. <laughs> I still remember that. You know, it was an exciting moment, really exciting. It kind of defined my career, because it's like, wow, we can really do something. Maybe we can fix the brain, because this is a new functional circuit in the brain. <laughs> and I just wish Cajal could have been there to see this. But there was a problem. Okay, can you figure out what the problem is? Well, it's a translational problem. It means, yeah, we can fix a circuit, we can make a new one, but how many of you out there really want a new retina in the back of your head? You know, anybody? <laughs> Not really. So now you see the problem. It's like, it's a cool result, but it doesn't translate into a therapy, does it? Um, there's more needed to make this really help people. Um, so I went back and started scratching my head and reading through a list of all the different conditions that afflict the human central nervous system, of which there are many. And I came upon one called retinitis pigmentosa, or RP. And I determined that, yeah, this is going to be the low-hanging fruit for some kind of regenerative intervention. RP, what is it? So it's a rare genetic condition. It affects the rods and cones. These are the photoreceptors at the back of the retina. They're the first step in the neural part of the visual pathway. Without rods and cones, you're not going to see anything. And unfortunately for people with RP, uh, their rods start to die, and that means they get night blindness. And then it doesn't stop there. The rods are degenerating, and the cones start to degenerate. And this gives them a tunnel vision, the tunnel we're talking about. And it doesn't stop there, it just keeps progressing, and it just closes in, and eventually it just robs them of all their sight. It's a horrible disease. And if you see somebody like Jack here with a, a white cane or a seeing eye dog, you know, chances are they have RP. So I said, you know, I'm gonna quit trying to fix the brain. I'm gonna concentrate on the retina, and I'm gonna go after RP. So I went into ophthalmology, and I did a fellowship, and I went to London, and I got to see people with RP, and I was working in the lab, working on the cure. Why? Because there was no treatment for this disease, and there still isn't. So there I was, working on it. And, you know, as things tend to go in the lab, it wasn't panning out quite the way I was hoping. <laughs> Once again, you know, coming up snake eyes. It was time to have a career. It was time to go out in the world, do your thing. And, I had already figured out that I was that guy who was going to treat RP. <laughs> Problem was, I had nothing to offer. <laughs> yeah, it was a very low moment. I'd created a job that didn't exist, you know. What was I, I going to do about this? Well, right in the nick of time, stem cells showed up. So one looked down the microscope, and I was just so blown away by what I was seeing. It was just absolutely incredible. So these cells could just migrate into the retina and organize themselves and into the, the retinal layers. They could integrate into the existing mature neural circuitry. That wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and make cells like these bipolar looking cells you see here. These came from progenitor cells that had been dumped uh, surreptitiously right into the jelly of the eye. So um, from there they found their way into the retina, take up uh, residence, they can repopulate the retina. It seems like, okay, we can treat RP now, right? Well, I decided to go all in. I was going to drop everything, do stem cell research, and um, that's when I ran into the next problem. So what was that? Well, these cells from the brain could do all kinds of amazing stuff in the retina, but they didn't make photoreceptors. Oh, that's what we need to treat RP. So the one thing we need is the one thing they can't do. There's this mismatch between this amazing result in the lab and what the patients actually need. What are you going to do about it? Well, I fell back on my embryology. I said, well, OK. Brain cells can't do it. They can't make new photoreceptors. Something has to make new photoreceptors. So there must be progenitors in the retina that can make photoreceptors, because we all have photoreceptors, don't we? So um, I reasoned that a retinal progenitor cell would be the right cell to make photoreceptors. But there was this new problem, and that is nobody had any retinal progenitor cells to hand out. You couldn't order them on Amazon or something. Nobody was growing these things. They knew they were in there somewhere, kind of like a black box, but what to do, what to do. So 
What we did is we adapted the technology that you use for growing brain progenitors and we tweaked it and twisted it until we could grow retinal progenitors in the laboratory and we did that. And after transplantation, sure enough, these cells were able to make photoreceptors like this beautiful rod you see here that's in a mouse retina. Okay, now we can treat RP, right? Of course we can. We can make photoreceptors. Well, not so fast. So what's the twist this time? Well, we can make photoreceptors, but how many photoreceptors can we actually make? Uh, we can make enough to get a publication, we can advance our career, but can we really treat patients? Because sporadic photoreceptors don't really do the job. If you think about your visual scene, you need millions, millions of photoreceptors to give you that view you have right now. Now, you could get a rudimentary view with fewer, but you know, a handful, mm, it's not going to cut it. So I had to rethink this whole thing. What am I going to do? Uh, and I decided, well, let's take these retinal progenitors. Uh, yeah, we can take them, we can genetically modify them, we can put a gene in there for a growth factor, a neuroprotective agent, and then we can deliver them to the eye, and then these cells will just spew out this protein, and the protein's gonna do the job. It's gonna rescue the host photoreceptors all over the retina, and that's gonna work great, okay? So it was, I think, a good idea. And then a weird twist came along. Um, and that was that investigators in China were all keen and fired up to try retinal progenitors in initial clinical trials. So we put some cell, uh, the cells were put in there. Um, my recommendation though is let's not try to use these fancy cells, the modified cells, go with the just plain vanilla unmodified cells, just put them in the jelly of the eye and try and get some safety data, just some initial safety data uh, to work with for using the simplest possible approach. So that was done and the cells were well tolerated and very importantly there wasn't evidence of immune rejection. Um, so that was really great. So it seemed like it was time to go back, modify the cells, make them more powerful. Um, but then there was this interesting twist. Reports started coming back that the patients were seeing better. Wow, crazy. That just didn't sound right to me. How, how could they be seeing better? Um, but in fact, uh, these reports kept happening and they were getting louder and the, and the patients obviously believed it because they started asking for an injection in their other eye. Well, at that point it seems like maybe we do have something that we could use in RP. Is this a treatment? Um, well, not so fast because you can't just go out there in a back alley here somewhere and start delivering RPCs to people like you're in some kind of Philip K. Dick novel or Neuromancer or something like that. I mean, you could probably do it, but you'd be in big trouble. So, uh, but more to the point, to get the professionals globally to acknowledge that this means something, you have to do it the right way. You have to have adequate number of patients, you have to have placebo controls, you have to have trials that are done to the Western standard. Knowing that, uh, we dropped everything and started working on the idea of having a trial here in California, uh, again, going at it from this very simple uh, perspective. And so, we, with the help of CIRM, uh, that's your tax dollars at work, folks, um, we were able to start this trial and we first dosed a patient in June of last year. We've been busy enrolling ever since and we hope to complete enrollment of this safety trial soon. The safety has been good. Um, and then there's an interesting point is that, again, we're hearing some stories that, well, patients are seeing more light. You know, maybe a lot more light. Is this the light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> finally? <laughs> well. I hope so, but you know, we have to be cautious. And the point here is we really do have to do those placebo controlled trials. We have to do that and we have to determine statistically if patients who are treated see better than, than placebo control. So we're still in the tunnel, we're crawling ahead, but I, there might be a flicker of light up ahead and we're gonna find out really soon. So I thank you for your attention.